Good. Okay. On that note, I think it's 8 p.m. and uh, Parshat Re'e that talks about the Jewish people coming in public to Yerushalayim together. But uh, that's the, the Parsha. We'll do a focus on the Haftorah. All right. Welcome, everybody. Okay. So, um, welcome to the third out of the seven Haftarot of Consolation. Um, since we know very little about their selection, it's difficult really to know um, who's the tail, uh, who's the dog, and who is wagging whom. That is to say, the fact that we can discern a, a, a progressive sequence amongst these Haftarot could indicate that they were chosen for that reason, or it could be that they were chosen randomly, but it's just simply a feature of human nature to try to discover uh, rhyme and reason where none really exist. So having said that, we're going to try this evening to place this Haftarah into the uh, pattern that was started by the two Haftarot that preceded it. So this Haftarah begins by addressing the Jewish people as Aniya So'ara. Aniya, poor, impoverished. It could be emotionally impoverished, hence the translation of unhappy. It could be impoverished in the, uh, uh, in the sense of literally having been stripped of all its possessions on account of its being sent into exile. So'ara. A ruach se'ara is a tempestuous wind. To refer to somebody as a so'ara means that they're unsteady. They're unsteady because, again, they've lost their homes, they've lost their fortunes. Lo nuchama. And the third adjective that's used to describe the Jewish people is either they are inconsolable Right, Lonuchama in the sense of they refuse to accept consolation, or Lonuchama in the sense that they're still in the process of being consoled. So, as you see on the screen, there is a way to discern a pattern amongst these Haftarot. We started on the Shabbat after Tisha B'Av with the Haftarot Nachamu Nachamu Ami. And we've mentioned at the time that the reason the word Nachamu is repeated is likely because the Jewish people were an unlikely candidate for consolation. Having undergone destruction, having undergone exile, it's easy to understand why they would have refused or even spurned words of consolation. Therefore, the prophet tries to console them by repeating himself. So in Nachamu Nachamu Ami, the prophet Yeshayahu promised comfort to the people, but the Haftarah itself gives no additional indication of how the people reacted, whether they accepted the words of consolation or not. Hence, the next week's Haftarah, which began with the words, Vatomer Tzion Azavani Hashem Vashem Shechechani. Zion, Jerusalem, the people of Israel, maintained that God had abandoned them, that he had forsaken them. That seems to indicate that the people had rejected the prophet's attempt at consoling them, insisting instead that God had abandoned them, therefore forcing the prophet Yeshayahu to once again issue words of comfort. Hence, this, the third Haftarah in the sequence, where we get the sense that even his repetition of words of consolation have not entirely succeeded, that the people are essentially suffering from, I guess, a kind of national post-traumatic stress disorder, some kind of shell shock, as it were, on account of their exile. Therefore, he now, speaks to them as you would expect someone to speak in a situation in which there has been some sort of estrangement. 
Exile, after all, is a form of estrangement. It could be compared, and there are such midrashim that compare it to a king who has banished the prince from his realm, or it can be compared to a husband who has separated from or even been divorced from his wife. And this separation has two dimensions to it, a physical dimension and a spiritual dimension. The physical dimension is that somebody who is banished from home has no roof over their heads, has no place to live, no place to sleep, has no means of livelihood, is probably hungry. That's the physical dimension of estrangement, of separation. Then there's, of course, the emotional or spiritual dimension as well. That's the consequence of the realization that what had previously been an intimate relationship has been severed and that there is a possibility that it may never be restored. Now, the physical dimension is reasonably objective. Okay? The emotional dimension is entirely subjective. And because they are different from each other, they are independent of each other. One of them can be resolved. The greatest likelihood, the physical dimension of estrangement can be resolved while the emotional dimension continues. So think of the experience of the Jewish people over the last 2000 years in exile. There have been moments in which the Jewish people were living in a golden exile. There's the, uh, the high middle ages in Spain that are even known as the golden age of Spain. There's a period in Italy during the Renaissance. There are periods in even central Europe during the late 18th, 19th century, during the enlightenment and the emancipation. And then there's the experience of the Jews in the United States, the golden Medina, in essence, a kind of gilded exile so that the physical dimension of the exile, of the estrangement, may find a resolution while the spiritual, emotional dimension persists. So in this Haftarah, the Navi begins by addressing the physical dimension. And therefore he says to the people who are impoverished, Hine anochi marbitz bapuch avanayach that I am so going to pave your, uh, your um, uh, streets, as it were, with precious stones. The Yisadetich and the foundations of your buildings will consist of sapirim, of sapphires. V'samti kadkod shim your windows weren't made of glass, but the apertures through which people looked would, uh, would be um, made of uh, a precious element called kadko. This just highly speculative. It appears here and nowhere else in Tanakh. So it's merely speculative that it's rubies. Maybe they chose rubies because uh, the, the puch, uh, the carbuncles are uh, grayish and sparkle. Uh, sapphires are bluish and sparkle. So, hey, why not throw in sapphires as well, right? Bluish, uh, I'm sorry, bluish sapphires. Why not throw in uh, rubies, red rubies, okay? And the gates to your cities will be made of shining stones. Again, the word ekdach appears nowhere else, although the Shoresh Kof Dalet Chet does have the significance of something that is either uh, extremely horrible, that is extremely bright. Uh, hence the, the uh, translation of precious stones, it might use a different expression, call them fiery stones. Behold Vulech, and indeed everything about you, La'av Nechefetz will be uh, made of the kinds of stones that people desire to have, gem stones. A promise that a people that is, when described in the opening verse as Soara, 
as tempestuous, the promise to them is that there will be peace and tranquility. And it speaks of all of the children of Israel as being limudei Hashem, disciples of the Lord. That's the theme that we're going to pursue in some detail when we're finished with the text of the Haftarah itself. I pose the question, just what does it take to be a disciple of the Lord? Uh, I don't know. Is, that, can you, is there a, the equivalent of a Torah in motion that features the Lord as a guest speaker, and all you need is the link in order to zoom in to the Lord, we'll have a look and to see just what Limudei Hashem means. But the promise is that there will be Rav Shlom Banayich, that the children of Israel will dwell in peace, in tranquility. And how will that come about? Bitztaka Tikonani, that the foundation of the Jewish people will rest upon the exercise of righteousness. And he says it both in the positive and in the negative. Keep a distance from all forms of oppression. And if you do so, there is a guarantee that you will have nothing to fear. And whatever it is that causes people to be fearful, will not even be able to approach you, let alone to threaten you. Hain, says the Lord, gor ya gor efes meoti, is anything, uh, can anything cause harm? Can anything uh, in, instill fear other than through the will of God? Migar ritach, says God to the Jewish people, anyone who wants to frighten you, Alayich Gipol, he will fall on your account, meaning it will be a failure. Now, in previous Haftarot, in previous prophecies of Nechama, of consolation, we saw that the promise of ultimate redemption was given solely on the strength of God's relationship to the people and to their ancestors, right? Right? Or God promises that he will redeem the Jewish people because of his desire to preserve his own respect, his own reputation. So on previous occasions, right, we see that the promise of redemption is independent of the behavior of the people. Here's just simply one. Uh, exemplary citation from an earlier chapter in the book of Yeshayahu, where he says to the people, Zuchor ele Yaakov Yisrael, he calls to the Jewish people, and he says, remember this, ki avdi ata, that you are the servant of God. Yitzarticha evedli, God created you, fashioned you to serve him. Ata Yisrael otinasheni, and therefore it is incumbent upon the Jewish people not to forget God. This is part of the liturgy of the Amim Anoraim. God says to the Jewish people that he is prepared to erase their sins uh, as easily as he can uh, cause the wind to blow a cloud away. And all of its iniquities again can be eliminated as easily as a cloud can be blown away. Shuva elai. Ki ga'alticha. Notice, shuva elai. God calls upon the Jewish people to return to him, and if you wish, to do repentance. Ki ga'alticha. After he has already redeemed them. So redemption is independent of repentance on the part of the Jewish people. Here, in this Haftarah, for the first time, we are given an indication that redemption is not a gift that God gives to the Jewish people completely free of charge, but it is something that the Jewish people has to earn. And how does it earn redemption? It earns it through repentance, through tshuva, and through improvement. Therefore, God says to them in the continuation, Hinei harash. God says, how does anything get manufactured? So, so you tell me, there's an artisan, right? A craftsman, but who created the craftsman? 
God created the craftsman, right? Nofer be'esh pecham. You have somebody who stands over a bellows, a smith, who stands over a bellows and blows air on the hot coals in order to cause a flame so that he can heat something up for a sculpture or for some other work of art. Motzikli l'ma'asehu, so that he is able to produce either the product of his work, the work of art, or even to produce the tools for other craftsmen to, to use in their professions. So just as there is a process of creativity in the world of art, Anochi barati mashchit l'chabel. God says, I have created instruments of destruction. But he says to the Jewish people, Klokli yutzar alayich, any tool, any instrument of destruction that was fashioned against you with you in mind as the target, lo yitzlach, it will not succeed. And anyone, literally any tongue, any speaker who takes you to court, you will turn the tables on them and you will defeat them in court. So this victory, two kinds of victory, victory over a, a physical foe who is attacking the Jewish people and, in, and intent upon their destruction, and one who challenges the Jewish people in court. That is more of a moral or philosophical or ideological challenge. God says in both of these cases, Zot nachalat avdei Hashem, that victory will be the lot of the servants of God. When, under what condition? Tzidkatam me'iti. If again, if they practice righteousness. Brought down a little midrash that I found. Kind of interesting midrash, the way it's formulated. It says, Kvar bisarani, I've already been informed, al yidei yishayah hanavi, by the prophet Isaiah, who said, who addressed the Jewish people in their exile as impoverished. So the Midrash asks rhetorically, how were they impoverished? Were they, remember we said at the, end, at, at, at the beginning that there are two kinds of poverty, right? There's, there is poverty that is, expresses itself in the absence of physical possessions. And then there is a spiritual poverty. So how are the Jewish people impoverished? So it says about them, Aniyam They are impoverished because when they lived in the land of Israel, when the temple stood, when the people were behaving properly, there was no shortage of righteous people, righteous people to lead them, righteous people to serve as examples. But now in the exile, right, there is a poverty of righteous people. Aniyah min Torah. There's a poverty of Torah study. Aniyami mitzvot. There is a poverty of the performance of the commandments. Umasim tovim. And there's even a poverty of the performance of even ordinary good deeds. And all of this, God says, can be resolved through the intensification of tzedakah, of righteousness, and through the process of repentance. And then he gets, says again to the Jewish people, Hoi kol anyone who is thirsty, come in and get a glass of water. And even people who have no money, you'll be able to obtain food and you'll be able to eat it. You'll be able to obtain food without payment. And without money, you'll be able to obtain yayin, the chala, not only water, but also wine and milk. He asks them rhetorically, why would you spend money 
for something that cannot feed you. Why would you spend your hard earned money below the sova by purchasing something that cannot give you satisfaction? Now, wait a second. He started off by saying, people, you must be thirsty, you must be hungry. I can give you something to drink and something to eat for free. And then he says, ostensibly, to the very same people, why are you spending your money on things that don't either don't slake your thirst or don't, uh, don't satisfy your hunger? So which one is it? Are the people impoverished and they can't even afford something to eat or drink? Or do the people have money, but they seem to be squandering their money by spending it on things that are not necessities and that don't provide them with satisfaction. So God says, Shimul Shamoa Eli. Notice the doubling of the verb for emphasis. If you listen carefully to me, says God, then Ichlutov, then you will eat well. Eat well in the sense that you will be satisfied with what you eat. And not only will you have the, an elemental level of satisfaction, meaning that you'll simply make your, you know, uh, uh, what is it called? The uh, required daily uh, 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 allocation of calories or whatever it is. Not only will, will, you, will you have this baseline, but the titaneg badeshen nafshechem. Your souls will enjoy the richest foods. So what we see here is kind of like, it's either a mixed message, meaning he's either addressing two audiences, one of whom is really poor and can't even afford the basic necessities of life. And the other seems to have a little money, but instead of spending that money wisely and acquiring things that are absolutely necessary, they seem to be squandering it on luxuries. Therefore, basically, God wants to teach the people a lesson in terms of what are basic necessities of life, as opposed to what are the luxuries. And here we have the assistance of the Talmud in identifying just what is a basic necessity of life and leaving everything beyond that as somewhat of a luxurious excess. And the Talmud says as follows, Amar Rabbi Hanina bar Idi, Lamma nimshalu divrei Torah lamayim. Why are words of Torah compared to water? Now, this isn't the first place in Tanakh in which a rabbi came along and said, you see the word water in the text? It doesn't mean H2O, it means Torah. Right? One of the earliest, I can't really tell you offhand which is the absolute earliest. I can tell you which appears to be the first in the sequence of the biblical texts. And that would appear to be the one at the end of the Sidra Bishalach, after the crossing of the sea, when the people are, as it were, first getting started on their trek through the wilderness. And it says, Vayelechu Shaloshet Yamim Bamidbar. They went three days journey into the wilderness. And they couldn't find water. And they turned to Moses and they said, we need water. And the rabbis come along and say, you can't go three days without H2O. That's a fact of physical life. But there is an equivalent fact of spiritual life. And the equivalent fact of spiritual life is that you cannot go three days without Torah. And indeed, if you stop to think about it, the rabbis made it possible for us that we do not go three days without Torah. Because even though during the time of Moses, it would seem that the only time in which the Torah was read in public was on Shabbat, and that may well have been the custom throughout the first temple period, we know that beginning with the uh, early, with the dawn of the second temple era, and with the arrival of Ezra, Nehemiah, 
and the Anshe Knesset Hagdola, the men of the Grand Assembly, they uh, enacted a different schedule of Torah reading. And they enacted Torah readings on market days, which were Mondays and Thursdays. So if you think about it, you read the Torah on Shabbat. Then you go Sunday without a public Torah reading, but you get one on Monday. Then you can go two days, Tuesday and Wednesday, without a public Torah reading, but you get it on the third day on Thursday. And then you go again on Friday without a public Torah reading, but you pick it up again on Shabbat. So indeed, we do not go three days without Torah. Of course, the idea isn't to just satisfy ourselves, to limit ourselves only to uh, our presence uh, in, in a synagogue when the Torah is being read in public. Right? As, as uh, uh, God said to uh, Yehoshua um, in a Haftarah that we looked at long ago, was the Haftarah of uh, Simchat Torah, God says of the Torah that it's something that one should study, one should recite by day and by night, every day. And there's even a, a, a proverb that the rabbis coined about daily Torah study. And the proverb is, Im ta'azeveni yom, if you forsake Torah study for but a single day, then Torah says, Yomayim e'ezveka. Then Torah says that it, it could be difficult to recover from that if you, as it were, willingly forsake Torah for a day. It may take you two additional days in order to recoup your loss. You think about it, right? How much is a yom and a yomayim? Im ta'azveni yom, if you abandon Torah for a single day, yomayim as veka, Torah says it may take you two days to recoup your loss. And so if you leave Torah for one day and it takes you two days to recoup your loss, then how many days have you gone without Torah? three days. And therefore, once again, the idea that you cannot go shloshet yamim, v'lo umayim, you cannot go three days without Torah. So here, once again, we find that nimshelu divrei Torah lemayim, that words of Torah are compared to water. Why? Because just as we'll see several features here of water that are applied to Torah as well. First of all, lo marvacha, to teach us. Mamayim minichim makom gavoa, v'holachim lemakom namoch, just as water obeys gravity, right? that it flows from on high downwards. Af divrei Torah, so it is with the Torah. Words of Torah ein mitkayimim, are not realized or not fulfilled, ela only, Words of Torah cannot necessarily be realized in someone who is up there. That is to say somebody, let's, let's use a comparable expression, whose nose is in the air, meaning someone who is arrogant. Words of Torah, like water, find their way. They seek their own level, the level of humility. Yamara Bioshaya, a second interpretation. Lamanim Shaludivre Torah Lishlosha Mashkin Halalu. Why is Torah compared in the verse we just read not only to water, but also to Yayin Vachalav, to wine and to milk? Lomar Lacha, to teach you. Mash Losha Mashkim Halalu. All three of these beverages. They are generally either stored in or served in, I won't say cheap vessels, but in commonplace vessels. 
right? Af divrei Torah. So it is with the words or the teachings of Torah. Ein mitkayanin ela b'misha da'ato shefeila. That again, they find their realization. They endure only amongst people who are down to earth. And the conclusion of the Haftarah is an allusion to a new covenant. Once again, the Navi says to the people, Hatu oznechem, right? Literally, incline your ear, a way of saying, listen carefully, listen attentively. Vishimu, and, and pay attention. Utchin nafshechem. And the result, if you pay attention, is that your spirits will be revived. brit olam. God says the consequence will be that he will forge with the Jewish people an everlasting and eternal covenant. And what is this everlasting covenant? Chasdei David haneemanim. The enduring loyalty between the mutual loyalty between God and the Davidic dynasty. Hain, God says of the Davidic dynasty, of David himself and of his descendants. I made him a leader of people. Nagid, a prince. Mitzavele umim, a commander of people. Hain. Goy lo te da tikra. And such a person, such a leader, someone possessed of these capabilities, can summon even nations with whom he previously had no relationship. The goy lo yuda and people from afar who never heard of King David or of the land of Israel or of the Jewish people, a lecha yarutsu, will rush to join them. Why? For the sake of God, the Holy One of Israel, because he is the source and the origin of the glory that the Jewish people will enjoy in the future. So as I told you previously, the question that I asked here is, Apropos of the verse, v'chol banayich, all of your sons, of your children, limudei Hashem, will be, as it were, disciples of God. How does one become a disciple of the Lord? So this is basically the history of, of classical and uh, medieval and some modern uh, uh, exegesis on this verse, starting with the venerable Aramaic Targum. And it renders the verse as follows. The Chobanayich, it's the same in Aramaic as it is in Hebrew, all your children, Alephin. Now, the verb Aleph Lamed Fe, you may recognize from the modern Hebrew word Ulpan. And Ulpan is someplace you go in order to learn something. Because the verb Aleph Lamed Feh means to provide enlightenment through education. Therefore, what does it mean to be Limudei Hashem, says the Aramaic Targum? It means to be Alephin, to be educated in what? Be'oraita Dashem, to be educated in God's Torah. So anybody who studies Torah, according to the Targum, is ipso facto, limudei Hashem, a disciple of the Lord. Interestingly, just a curiosity, there is no commentary of Rashi on this verse, but Rabbi Yosef Kara was a disciple of Rashi. He sat there in Rashi's classroom and took notes. In fact, there's a pretty good theory that says that what we call the commentary of Rashi started out with the notes that this Rabbi Yosef Kara took 
as he sat in Rashi's classroom. So we presume that his own comments and interpretations mirror those of his teacher. So what is he, how does he define Limudei Hashem, disciples of the Lord? It means melumadim, people who are educated, lalechet bidrachav, to follow as it were in God's footsteps. How do you follow in God's footsteps? Famous passage, right? How can we follow? It says, Achare Hashem Elokecha Telechu. You should follow after God. How do you follow after God when the Torah itself declares that Hashem, God, is Esh Ochala? He's an all consuming fire. So the answer we are told is what the philosophers call imitatio dei, to pattern our behavior after His. Right? Just as he is compassionate, we are enjoined to be compassionate. Just as he feeds the hungry and clothes uh, the needy, so should we, etc., etc. Ibn Ezra simply says, addresses the word limude grammatically and says the word limude is just a fancy way of saying Talmide. Now that's a nice one, because when you say limud, you mean somebody who learns from God. You think you learn from God by sitting and opening a textbook, right? The Torah. So even if God isn't present, so to speak, right, you can still be a disciple of God by reading his book. When Ibn Ezra substitutes the word Talmide, that creates a different mental image. A Talmud is somebody who is sitting in the presence of his teacher. And therefore Ibn Ezra says that Limudei Hashem are essentially Talmidei Hashem, those who almost literally sit and learn in God's presence. Radak reminds us that actually just last week, we read a section of a Haftarah that included a statement on the part of the prophet where he said, Hashem Elokim natan li lishmoa balimudim. It says, natan li lashon, God gave me the power of speech, ladaat laot et ya'ef davar, he gave me the, the opportunity or the skill of being able to speak to people in a way that they will find memorable, uh, uh, to, to make me an effective teacher. And at the end, he says that he rouses, that every morning, as it were, Ya'irli, he rouses me and he gives me Lashon Limudin. So Radak connects Lishmoa Balimudin of that previous verse with Limudei Hashem of this verse. And just a reminder, because we looked at Ibn Ezra and Malbim when we read that Pasuk last week, Ibn Ezra told us that God stirs me up every morning. He stirs up my ear that I may listen how? As pupils do. That is to say, I listen attentively because I know that I'm going to be tested on the material, right? And I want to make sure that I get an A because if I don't get an A, right, then I'm going to be embarrassed to show up at dinner, okay? let alone that I'm going to somehow, you know, ruin my life and I won't make it into Harvard Law School and all the other things that parents use to put the fear of failure into their children. In any event, Malbim had, I thought, a, a more um, a pedagogically professional interpretation. Malbim said um, that a prophet must speak clearly, not cryptically, and must be able to illustrate his thoughts, how? According to the intelligence and comprehension of his audience. That's an effective teacher too, right? What may be effective with one class may not be as effective with another. Hence, the Navi said, of God, he rouses my ear to give heed like disciples, I heard the prophecy from his lips according to the ability of pedagogues and students, each according to his comprehension. 
כפי השגת העם. שדל, early 19th century, איטלי, like Ibn Ezra, interpreted לימודי השם as תלמידי השם, God students, but he added ויו דאב, those who know him, in a sense as I said, as though they were actually seated in his classroom. And he cites a very important verse, a verse in the prophet Joel, who speaking of the eschatological future, gives the Jewish people a promise in the name of God, after that, meaning after the, the, the redemption, God says that if in the past prophecy was something that was that was given only to selected individuals, the day will yet come in the future that God says that he will, so to speak, pour out the spirit of prophecy over all living people, over all flesh. Your children will prophesy. And the old will have dreams. He means prophetic dreams. And the young will see visions. You know, there's a passage in the Talmud, in Masachet Megillah, that asks rhetorically, How many prophets? did the Jewish people have? Now, if you go through Tanakh, okay? If you go through Tanakh, what do you think the answer is gonna be? Is it gonna be a big number or is it gonna be a little number? Well, think about it. We know that Moses was a prophet and Joshua was a prophet and Samuel was a prophet. And we know that there were two other prophets mentioned in the book of Samuel, Nathan and Gad, okay? All right, that's five. And then we know that there was Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, that's eight. Then we know there's a book called the 12 prophets. Ooh, eight and 12 is 20, okay? Now, after that, it gets a little touchy because was Daniel a prophet or was Daniel just a wise man? Were Ezra and Nehemiah prophets or were they just inspired leaders of the Jewish people? So the answer is that it's very difficult, I, I, I named 20, you know, by name. So let's say I'm off by 50%. And let's say that somehow if we scour the Tanakh with the proverbial fine tooth comb, we'll come up with the names of another 10 prophets. Ooh, I forgot the prophet to Siz. So there were seven of them. Okay, so we've gone from 20 to 37. We still haven't hit 40, let alone 50. So when the Talmud asks rhetorically, how many prophets were there amongst the Jewish people? You expect there to be a finite answer. And the answer isn't finite. The answer is that there were among the Jewish people twice as many prophets as there were Israelites who left the Egyptian bondage. Now there were 600,000 adult males who left Egypt. So even if we wanted to just simply multiply that number and not even consider people who were above the age of, of, of 60 or below the age of 20, and, and we weren't even counting women, right? That would give us what's twice 600,000? it would give us 1,200,000 prophets. Now, is that hyperbole? Or is that perhaps an expectation, an anticipation? Because if indeed, if we take the prophet Joel at his word, and God says that the day will come in which the spirit of God will be distributed freely so that people of all ages will prophesy, then heck, 1,200,000 isn't quite that many. I want to end with this, because 
the promise was, v'chol banayich limudei Hashem, that if all of the children of Israel become pupils of the Lord, then the continuation is, v'rav shlom banayich, then their, their peace, their tranquility will be enhanced. This is a very famous passage, so famous, in fact, that it's been incorporated into the liturgy. We say it on Shabbat and on Yamim Tovim. It's pretty much the conclusion of the Musaf service, just the last thing that we say before Aleinu at the conclusion of Musaf. It's a passage that comes from the very end. It's the concluding passage in Masechet Brachot. Amar Rabbi Elazar, Amar Rabbi Hanina, Talmidei Chachamim, Marbim shalom ba'olam. Talmidei chachamim. It's translated here as disciples of the wise. If you're going to pluralize disciples, you have to, because it says talmidei, which means talmidim in the plural, then you should pluralize chachamim. I know that most people, and I'm understating it when I say most people, because the number of people I have asked who know the right answer to this question, I can count on the fingers of one hand, even if I'm clenching a fist. People think that the singular of Talmidei Chachamim is Talmid Chacham. Not true. Not true grammatically and not true ideationally. The singular of Talmidei Chachamim is Talmid Chachamim. The, plur- the singular of Bate Midrashot is Beit Midrashot, of Bate Tefila, right? It's all the same. The singular form of Talmidei Chachamim is Talmid Chachamim. Why? First of all, as I said, there's the grammatical reason. The second is because the rabbis did not see a virtue in being the disciple of only one teacher. The virtue is in learning from many teachers. Therefore, they encouraged people to be Talmid Chachamim, to be a disciple of the wise men, of the sages, of the scholars. Yes, it says, Asselachara, when it comes to making halachic decisions, you can't just simply go around and ask all of your teachers, and then as it were, just simply poll them for the answers. You're supposed to choose somebody and abide by that person's decisions. But until you get to the point that you know how to phrase your questions, until you get to the point where you can understand the nuances of the answers that you get, it is a greater advantage to be a disciple of several sages than to somehow restrict yourself to a single one. In any event, says Rabbi Elazar, Talmidei Chachamim, the students, the disciples of the sages, Marbim Shalom Ba'olam. They are responsible for enhancing or increasing peace in the world. And his proof text is the Pasuk from our Haftarah, the Chobanayich Limudei Hashem, that if everybody becomes a disciple of God, a Talmid Chachamim, Rav Shlom Banayich, then there will be an increase in peace and in tranquility. And the famous Al Tikre, the homiletical reading, don't read it as though it said Banayich, your children, but rather as though it said Bonayich, those who are responsible for building you, your construction workers, as it were. Shalom Rav Laohave Torah Techa, again the notion of enhanced or increased peace going to those who love the Torah, and as a 
consequence of their love of Torah and their enjoyment of tranquility, they will never, uh, they will never stumble. In order to ensure that there is peace within, tranquility within our dwelling places, within our palaces, for the sake of the brothers, the friends, the people of Israel, Adabrana Shalombach. We should always speak words of shalom. Words of shalom we saw are words of Torah, but words of Torah that recognize that just as water seeks its own level, words of Torah are best spoken and best understood when they are down to earth. Laban Beit Hashem Elokeinu Avakesha Tovlach, if you want to seek Tov, as God promised them, that they will be able not only to sustain themselves, baseline sustenance, but will be able even to enjoy luxuries. And here we're talking about spiritual luxuries. Hashem oz lamo yiten, and God will give the Jewish people the strength and the fortitude to stand up for what they believe in. How? Hashem yevarech et amo bashalom, by blessing them with peace with Shalom, and with that, I think we conclude. Thank you. You want to take a look at a couple comments? Then I have. I am. Look, whoa, seems to have got some comments this evening. Let's go back and see what we have. No sapphires in the Levant. Uh, okay, I, 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 um, uh, somewhere I've got a book on biblical geology. Uh, the most uh, um, erudite attempt at identifying the 12 precious stones that were inlaid in the Choshen, and something tells me that one of them was a sapphire. Uh, if it's lapis lazuli, I think I had that notation there. It could have been that instead, but it's entirely possible. I, I, I don't know. Um, what is this? color of Tehillet. I don't know what the color of Tehillet is. I don't think anybody today knows for sure what the color of Tehillet is. The fact that the people go around, wear Talesin with blue threads, and even have a little, you know, little plumb attached to it, saying that some institute in Israel certifies that this is Tehillet, means nothing more than it did 100 years ago when the Regina Rebbe decided that he knew what Tehillet was. In fact, to me, the paradox is that people who dismiss the Regina Rebbe, because he only relied on tradition, right, jump now to put Tehillet on their tzitzis because science approves of it. So here you have people who disdain science, who won't teach science to their children in their schools, but if science says that we've discovered Tehillet, they put everybody, they put Tehillet on their on their tzitziyot. Bakasha. It could be that it is the tchelet, but I don't think that the that the uh, um, the, the certification of the tchelet institute of wherever it is. As I said, I don't think that it is any greater authority than the Regina Rebbe. That's my personal uh, my personal position. The master skill steel. Klealayich Yutzar, says the man, I don't know, the mask, the steel, no, no idea, no. Livnat um, Sapir, well, okay, so it doesn't say whether, whether Sapir is a sapphire or whether it's only a sapphire because of the assonance between the two words, and th th that, that's a possibility too. Yes, naming prophets Eliyahu and Elisha, yes. Uh, hundreds of Nivian hid in the caves. They weren't Nivian, they were B'nai Nivian. Maybe we'll spend one day talking about B'nai Nivian. Actually, we missed our opportunity because there was a Haftarah that said, Yishachat min shei b'nei ha-nivim tza'akal elo yishalei mor. We did that Haftarah about the, the wife of one of the uh, B'nei ha-nivim. Question is whether B'nei ha-nivim were prophets in training, or the B'nei ha-nivim were literally children whose fathers were prophets, or whether B'nai Hanivim is simply a euphemism for Torah scholars. That's a possibility. Okay. 
Um, he doesn't different levels of prophecy. I don't know that there were different levels of prophecy. Far as I know, there was only one level of prophecy. Two, well, the only two levels of prophecy is that nobody matched the level of Moses. But all other prophets, so far as I know, were on the same level. Um, the, the artificial distinction that many people draw between Nevi'im and Ketuvim by saying that Nevi'im are books that were written by prophets, while Ketuvim are books that were written by people who didn't have prophecy, but they had a lower level that was called Ruach HaKodesh, Holy Spirit, doesn't hold water. Whether the water is Torah or whether the water is water, it doesn't hold water because the book of Ruth was written by Samuel. Right? And the book of Kinot was written by Jeremiah. Right? And the book of Ecclesiastes was written by, Sam, by, 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 by Solomon. So I, 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 I don't, you know, that, that's, that is an artificial distinction that has its roots in the Middle Ages and, and probably meant something other than what it is usually assumed to mean. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, Rabbi Muvak, as I said, that, that's the idea of Asei Lecha Rav. But it wasn't, the intention wasn't that, that people should, should limit themselves their exposure to just one chacham. Okay, been a sense of humor. Um, well, actually, I, I, I had, I had a, a professor at YU, Professor Gershon Horgan, um, younger brother of the better known Professor Pinchas Horgan, who was the founder of Bar Ilan University. Uh, and I think never came out of the shadow of his, never came out of his brother's shadow, uh, was fond of saying, that Talmudic texts have no punctuation marks. Therefore, things that we might assume are to be read as exclamations might have been intended to be read as questions. And his favorite example was Kinat Sofrim Tarbe Chochma. In any event, that's it. I thought he would say Talmudic Chachamim Marvim Shalom Ba'olam. That's the uh, other one, you know, but. Uh, by the way, as one who wears tchelet and uh, holds some science, we can have that discussion about tchelet later on. I think there is a lot of evidence, uh, maybe scientific, that it's it's much different than the tchelet of the Radzina Rebbe. But okay, that's for another time. And um, um, uh, I will say also what you tell on Talmidei Chachamim reminded me what you know Dr. Lam used to say about Emunat Chachamim. You know the way it's used today in much of the world, but and in Perkeavo, one of the forty-eight ways to wisdom, you know, the emunat, you know, chachamim, that he meant it meant the faith of wise people. In other words, a sophisticated faith. It doesn't mean blindly following the rabbis. It's the emunat chachamim is emuna that is based on wisdom and a, a sophisticated. I just sort of when you were talking to me, the chachamim, that kind of reminded me of that. So, so thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody. Tomorrow morning, well, not exactly morning, tomorrow at 12.15, uh, I guess that's the afternoon, Rabbi Jonathan Ziering completes his series on Shemitah. Uh, tomorrow he'll be discussing Tosef at Shemitah, I think expanding the holiness of, uh, of Shemitah. That's tomorrow at 12.15. Tomorrow night, our Parsha Shir, 8.30 p.m., will be given by Rabbi Eitan Aviner, who is the Mashkiach Ruchani at uh, Orchaim, uh, the Bnei Kiva High School here in Toronto. Uh, Friday morning, I'll be giving my Perkei Avot Shir, please God, at 9.30. Sunday, Rabbi Liebtag um, begins his, uh, continues his series on Save Ram, and next week we begin, we'll be sending out some of our Elul programming. Monday night, it's not exactly for Elul, uh, I mean, not, not for Elul, but it's not a, a specific Elul program. Mark Shapiro is resuming, resuming really after a year and a half his series on great rabbinic like thinkers he had spoken uh he we spent a year on his recent book but now his original series we're going to begin talk 196 196 in this ongoing series of course every you know five six seven eight however long it takes we switch uh great rabbinic thinkers and we're going to be starting this uh, series on shrav shaul lieberman uh great gaon in slobotka of course then later comes to america marries the granddaughter of the nitziv uh spends his uh career in America at JTS, and uh, Mark actually wrote a book, Shaul Lieberman and the Orthodox, a quite a fascinating book, and so that'll begin Monday night, and then uh, Thursday, 
um, Ari Shvat is going to be beginning a series on Orot HaKodesh of Rav Kook, or Orot Shuva of Rav, Rav Kook. And uh, we're starting next week, say for Yona, a whole bunch of series. We'll send out an email soon. Some of it is actually posted on the website already. Um, if you want to register for our classes with one thing, and then we'll send you all the updates. And uh, some we're just waiting to finalize timing and dates, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, we're, we're almost there and uh, we're posting it as we go along. But that'll be, uh, so we're going to, we have a lot, Baruch Hashem, coming up in Elulzman. Um, Benny Gesundheit is going to be giving a series on, on the Machsor, uh, all kinds of, uh, of good stuff. So we look forward to learning with you and we look forward to you inviting your friends to come and join us and learn. So uh, got a uh, lot to Elul is early this year, or as, uh, what can we say, very early. And uh, all right, that uh, we blow show for Monday morning. So everybody get get ready. Uh, and uh, okay, Dr. Sokolo, anything you want to add to that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to start. We're going to have to get, I don't know, all the Haftaris for Yontif and everything. It's, uh, we have to figure out how we're going to get them all in because uh, there's a lot of Haftarat coming up in, in Chodesh Tishrei. But anyways, okay. All right, Lila, to everybody, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow, 12.15, 8.30, and um, all the best. Have a wonderful night. Thank you very much. Yeah, we, we do have to talk at some point. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. We'll have Bye. to talk what we're going to do next year. You know, I don't know, you know, like that. <laughs> well, it's not just that. I mean, it, we also lose all the Wednesdays. Yes, yes, we lose all the Wednesdays. So we'll have with that. That's a, I don't know. We, we will talk. I'm happy to we switch into the daytime. I don't know what we'll do exactly. We'll uh, we can talk. If anybody has any ideas, uh, whatever. It's it's a Bar Hashem. It's it's a good problem to have. These are the good problems. Uh, I have a a, a memory. It's, it's, it's partially a visual memory, but just partially a recollection of, of, of when I was, I, I'm guessing maybe 10 years old, uh, of running an errand for one of my teachers in Yeshiva Seitz Chaim in Borough Park and delivering something to the Regina Rebbe. Aha. Uh -huh. So, you know, uh, and, and so I, I, I mean, you know, and, and, and and it wasn't just it was a tzitz, it's not his talas, and mm -hmm. you know. So, um, but as I said, I, you know, I, I, the thing that I, I find amazing is that the, the, the Haredi world—they're right? not into tchelit, as far as I know, so much. They're not. Are, are they? They're getting into it. They weren't because it started from the modern Orthodox world, the revival of tchelit. Yes, I'm saying. But the strange, the strange thing is, is that you find Haredim who, 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 you know, I don't know why they rejected the regina. Maybe it's 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 intramural Hasidic politics, you know. I but, mean, from what my understanding is, that was Rav Herzog, the first, you know, chief rabbi of Israel. The um, Rav Herzog's like PhD thesis was on the. Right. The yeah. Tchelet, the Radzina Tchelet, is showing why it's not the real Tchelet, and that they, they had lost the method of making it during the war. And be, based on Rav Herzog's research, they recreated their method of making. So even though Rav Herzog proved them wrong, he, you know, he uh, he gave them to the, the continue, but he couldn't quite figure it out. But he laid the groundwork for the later discovery based on archaeology, and you read all the stuff going on in Tchelet and. I guess being in Rav Shechter's year for four years, uh, you know, Rav Shechter very strongly believes in Tchelet. He believes so strongly in Tchelet, he feels you're not allowed to wear a baget of Arba Kanfut if you don't have Tchelet on it. Uh, he says better not to put on I, I, I Maybe he changed his mind, but I heard him say that more on more than one occasion because he felt it's Bal Baltigra. You're putting on a four car. I'm not saying, to, yeah, I don't I'm tell people that. I don't tell people that. I'm just saying that was his view. No, 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 I, I get that. I, I, I also... I also know that look, if if you're married, and you put on a talis gadol, so you don't make a separate bracha on the talis koton anyway. Right. Right. So it's no question of a bracha of atolo or anything. No, he just felt that you're wearing arba. In other words, you know, you know the famous thing: the Balamor never wore tzitzis. Uh, those who are left, the Balamor, the great uh, 12th century provincial sage, is in print in the back of the Gemara, the Chavrus of the Rivet. So the Balamor was a, quite a fascinating person, um, Rav Zerachia Halevi, but uh, known as the Balamor because he lived in Provence and uh, he lived in Lunel 
And Lunel, of course, means moon. So he wrote this book, Hamaor HaKatan, the little light. And then he wrote Hamaor HaGadol, the big light. You need sunlight on the Zikin, the harder Gemara. So he's known as the Balamor. So the Balamor never wore tzitzis in his life because he, I, I, mean, I assume when he was a little kid, his parents put it on, on tzitzis. But once he became learned, he never wore tzitzis because he paskin like the view in the Gemara. It's a machloket that uh, you can't, if you only have three parts shared in the tulin, you, you're missing a lulav. You have an etrog hadas and So there's no mitzvah, all four, or it's a for nothing. So the view in the Kamara, one view is that the Tchel and the Laban go together without Tchel, can wear tzitzis. So we obviously don't hold by that view, but the Balamor held by that view. So the Balamor never wore tzitzis in his life. That's a, that's a kind of a funny thing, you know, if ever anybody drives you crazy why you don't wear tzitzis, so you can say, I follow the Balamor, but that excuse doesn't work. So Rav Shachter felt, but once we discovered Tchel, then to wear sits it's, it's true we follow the view of the Chachamim that you can wear the Lavan without the Tchelet. But once we have the Tchelet, not to wear it would be a violation of Baal Tigra, that the Torah tells you to do Mitzvah A and you're doing it A minus. And that's, that's even though we sometimes think low tigra, you know, three parts shot in the tefillin or whatever. So he, that's what he felt. So I, I think it's a very unusual view. I don't think it's a mainstream view, but, uh, but I do wear tefillin on my tzitzis. And, uh, you know, on, and I, yeah, so it's, um, Anyways, but yeah, but it's very much in the modern Orthodox world. I don't see it here, and I don't see any Haredim where they're they're opposed to it. The Haredim here and the Rabbi Miller, I think, wrote a whole piece attacking it. It's a terrible thing to wear tchelat and uh, whatever. But I don't know. I don't know. Maybe in New York, it's a little bit different. Maybe the, so we the have it's, it's in it's, it's in that at that segment of the Haredi community that my, my sociological term for it is charcoal gray. Uh-huh. See, mine are nice and blue, you know, that's, uh, I mean, uh, that's why I, I, I got rid of my black stripe on my talus, you know, like that's the, the reason the, this talus has a black stripe, most talisim, because the black, it's a machloka, Rashi Rambam, is, is the tchelet black or blue, right, so that's a, uh, so well, we today, everybody assumes it's blue, but the, the tzitzis makers, the talus makers assumed it was black. So they put a black stripe. That's why some tzitzis have a blue stripe. That's why you know, people think modern, more, it has nothing to do with modern or not modern. It has to do with uh, that. The, what's the color of the tchelet. But once I got a black, uh, blue tchelet, so why do I have a black stripe? Unless I want to hold like the other view, maybe they're right. So I don't know. Zecher le tchelet, have a black, but I now have a blue uh, and then, of course, I bought the Yontif talus, like in Israel, the common pure white, you know, that, uh, I don't know, that's the last talus I bought of you. I just wear it so only on Yontif so far, uh, only Yontif, so I have, uh, anyways. Okay, I'm impressed how many people stay for the conversation. And look, I've nothing better to do. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Way, I look you... forward to learning with you. Always interested in your comments, suggestions, criticisms, uh, ideas, and uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. Okay, by thank the way, you. Jay, Jay, the yes. yek is, the yek is where the yek is where white towels yam in the rhyme on it. Only Yamim no Rhyme. So when I first yamim got it, I just, I wore it for the first time with Shani Yom Kippur. Yeah. I, I believe. But, the, but I wear it, I wear that. A lot that of Til Hoshan Rabba. The truth of the matter is, I bought it just before COVID. <laughs> I, I, you know, a little before, I I, I had to, I had a Shabbos talus and a regular talus, and now I got sort of a, a third talus, you know, a Yantif uh, talus. So I, when I was in Israel, I said, the minute, so I said, okay, for Yantif, Yamim Noraim, all white, fine. But uh, anyways, okay. Uh, so they, there they were all, yeah, I heard they they changed the Aaron in, in Breuer's, right? Yeah, like, they changed the parochas for right, every Yantif. I mean. For every, every, every Yantif has a different parochas. Well, they're different. Yeah, they yeah they have different uh, parochas for a lot of different things. Yeah, right. I know different. Some shuls have a different. I imagine employers too on on the chadodi different the chadodis. You know, yeah, for the three weeks. yeah. yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. They, they hold me in hockey. Different shir, different different shir hamalos for different. Uh, yeah, so it's uh, we don't. I don't. What can I tell? You? I, it's real, nice that somebody upholds me in hockey like that. Real real Breuer's has no chadodi. Oh, they don't say Lechadoti? You know who the person who instituted Lechadoti, the last one is, I think in Germany, was Marcus Jastrow, if I'm not mistaken, of dictionary fame. For hundreds of years, they didn't say they didn't say Kabbalah Shabbos in Germany. You know, some Kabbalist in Svat came up with this idea, like, you know, we don't have to follow that. We there's, a, there's a sefer, there's a sefer called Kihila Shlomo. Not it familiar. Could be, okay. Could be for all I know, it could be pronounced Koheles Shlomo. Okay. 
The author was Shlomo Geiger. Avram Geiger's brother, son, father, uncle, nephew, brother. Brother, brother to Abraham Geiger. Basically, the founder of reform in many ways. Yeah. Sorry? Their father, their father was the Chazen Rishon in the old shul in Frankfurt. Aha. Uh -huh. And during the year that he was saying, during the year that he was saying Kaddish, he made it, made a neder to keep track, to make notes of all the Minhage Tfila. And that's the Sefer, Kihila Shlomo. And that's what they use today? They found that? That's the safer. That's sort of the the Bible of Minhagim and Breuer's in Frankfurt. I don't know what Breuer's. You know, it, it well, changed. Well, Breuer's follows Breuer's follows Frankfurt. Yeah. yeah. Who but, follows Hamburg? Because there were different Minhagim in Hang Hamburg and different in Frankfurt. You know, Breuer's Breuer's follows Frankfurt. No such thing. Aha. As far as I know. Which Frankfurt? Frankfurt am Main. He writes. No, no, no. He writes as follows. Well, there were two. There were he two. Says that Kabbalah Shabbos, he writes that Kabbalah Shabbos can be recited only in the new shul, not in the old one. It can be led only by the Chazan Sheni, not by the Chazan Rishon, who does not stand at the Omud, but he stands at the Bima, and he can't wear a talus. Uh huh which is tantamount, essentially tantamount to saying, this doesn't count. Well, that's why in a lot of shuas and normal shuas, the, the, for Kabbalah Shabbos, they stand by the bima where they do Kriya Satora and only for Barkhu does the chasen go to the Amut in a lot of shuls. <laughs> and that's really the basis of the Minag. They would have kids. I remember we, I, was, I was nine years old and our family was on sabbatical in Israel, went to grade four in, in Yerushalayim. And I used to go Friday night. That, that's where I learned how to dub in Kabbalah Shabbos sometimes. We didn't go to the Kotel. We went uh, on Jabotinsky Street. Uh, we were, so we, you know, they had kids dub in Kabbalah the Shabbos every week because uh, you know that's uh, and then I had uh, I won't mention his name but the, one of the rabbis told me that um, um, he used to have kids dove in his shul and then all the women complained says no if you can have a kid dove in Kabbalah you can have the woman complain I mean in the partnership minion that's what they do Kabbalah Shabbos doesn't need a minion you have a woman dove in so he didn't want to say he felt it's not nice it's not for Kabbalah to the kids dove in but not the women dove in. interesting interesting uh, you know that uh, anyways that's a whole other other parsha for another time okay what's david saying david i hope everybody's well have you heard from eliyahu um i believe relevant our our children dave the freudenstein and our son and two other their classmates are on their way to israel please god and the flight to yeshiva haritzion so they're on the plane together. so far so good so far so good yeah 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 so what are you writing david i believe relevant for the frankfurt on main and other Turkish Minhagim is also a safer title, Sharshe Minhag Ashkenazi. I'm not familiar at all. Anybody who is, uh, please. That was Yekish, not Turkish. That's a spell check. Yeah. Oh, Yekish. Yeah, yeah. Yekish. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was wondering, what are you talking about Turkish Minhagim? It's a batch, it's a, it's a batch of volumes and is written by Rabbi Bemberger in, uh, Rabbi Bemberger, no, Hamburger, I'm sorry, by Hamburger in Bnei Brak. Oh. He wrote this, uh, Sharshe Minhag Ashkenazi. You know, of course, if you go on Frankfurt on Main, uh, fr yeah. uh, when we were there, you go at the Kever of yeah. Shishkal Hirsch, I mentioned his, yeah. his name was Hamburger. We, yeah. Rafa, I, I was blown away when I first saw this. I was like, I couldn't believe it. His name was Shimshon. His father's name was Rafal Hirsch. Right. It, it says on the cover, Shimshon Ben Rafal Hirsch Hamburger. That was his name. Mm -hmm. And That's somehow he got known as Shimshon Rafal Hirsch, Rafal Hirsch, whatever. And that wasn't his name. Rafal Hirsch is his father and he's Hamburger. Right. Uh, I, I was like, I couldn't believe it. Like, you know, uh, anyways. Actually, I, I believe that Rabbi Bamberger is connected and there is something called Minag Marashe. I'm probably uh, uh, bastardizing the pronunciation. Minag Marashe Ashkenaz. And there is or was an active uh, minion in Baltimore uh, that kept up these minhagim. And I believe there was mm -hmm. a Rabbi Bambiger involved. Yeah. So you're not yeah. wrong. You're not wrong, Rabbi mm -hmm. David. Somebody just posted a, a link if he wants to see a, a Moreshet. That's it. Mar Hamaker. Okay. Okay. We'll That's have to it. take a look. 
Okay, thank you everybody for that. Always uh, some, I, I don't want to take away from the class at all, but sometimes the post-class discussion are just as interesting Rav, as Rav the Jay, class. You have, yeah. to, you have to tell people about the amazing replay of that Rav Hirsch symposium from a few years ago, right? That, was that we a, ran, yeah. Rav Hirsch, uh, a classic Torah motion I, success. I'll have to get it. Yeah, years ago, we, we ran a program on Rav Hirsch and we had actually the person who was living in Frankfurt. Uh, she gave me her book on, uh, on Rabbi Noble was the rabbi in the shul, the, the, the community shul, you know, opposite her, that the, the Hershey and couldn't dove in that shul. That was, you know, the, uh, but uh, yeah, that, that was a great conference. Yeah, yeah. So uh, years ago, it's, we, I have to find, it's, I have to look on our, our website for all the talks that we did it on, on Shinshir Fell Hirsch. Right. I guess we did it for maybe his 200th birthday in 2008. He was born in 1808, Hirsch. So I think that's Sounds when we right. did it in honor yeah. of the 200th birthday. Right. Yeah, back, back when Jim it was. Sean, Ben, at that time, I called him Shimshon Hirsch. It was only in 2011 when I went to Frankfurt for the first time that I realized he's Shimshon Ben Rafal Hirsch. But, uh oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyways, all right. Lila Tov, everybody. I okay. think. Uh, okay. Watch Have the Olympics good. for fun or something. I don't know. Have uh, a good night. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. Okay. Lila Tov, everybody. Thank you.